It is Thursday, April 15th. We got a big, big show for you. It's a little bit of a, a conspiracy story. Um, and, and, and I'm going to be honest, if you really listen to all of this, and then if you go to framingpaterno.com with John Ziegler, you're going to find out there's a lot more to the Jerry Sandusky story than you might think. All we've been told is what the media told us, right? Granted, it's an older story. People have already made up their minds. But I would challenge you to try to listen to what John Ziegler has to say. Listen to the interviews. Listen to all the details around this case because after doing it and spending about 30 hours kind of going through his research, I will tell you this. I'm skeptical that Jerry Sandusky ever committed sexual abuse. I'm skeptical because I don't trust the media. I don't trust the system. I don't trust any of it because of the stuff that has went on over the last 5, 10, 15 years. So anyways, we're going to get to this. I want to I want to detail first before we move on. Comment below if you think Jerry Sandusky committed sexual abuse. Not was he a weird guy, not was he a bad guy, but did he commit a crime? Did he sexually abuse young children? That's what I want to know. Yes or no, simple question. Comment down below. Now, I want to outline some of the players that John's going to talk about because I, I'll be honest, I didn't know all of them. I mean, everyone knows Joe Paterno, the, the, the famed head coach, I mean, legend in state college and nationally at Penn State, and he is a legend cover-up of sexual abuse of Jerry Sandusky. Everyone knows Jerry Sandusky, this monster, child abuser, sexual molester, right? And we're going to find out if he's maybe just a weird guy and an, and an old guy at this point. And then the guys that I didn't really know, the first and foremost, what this case resided on entirely was Mike McQuery, the ginger football coach who walked in and saw Jerry Sandusky sexually abusing a kid, did nothing, told the cop, didn't tell the cops, didn't do anything. And his story has changed 17 times. He ended up getting paid off $12.3 million. So he became a millionaire because he saw this sexual abuse, right? He's a big key player in this. Gary Schultz, the former vice president of Penn State, who was who oversaw campus police, played a major role in all of this. Spent two months in jail for it. So you need to know who he is. Alan Myers is the kid from the shower that Mike McQuarrie saw. He also is a, a guy now, a man that saw Joe Pater saw Jerry Sandusky as a father figure his entire life until the attorney Andrew Shubin. The civil attorney who conjured up all these victims to go after Penn State civilly and win millions and millions and millions of dollars. So I challenge you to listen and think outside the box and say, eh, could there be more to this? Could this be a media witch hunt for Jerry Sandusky? Could this be a civil lawyer who wanted to make a ton of money? Could this be a farce? That's the question. Comment below if you think this is... This really happened. Did Jerry Sandusky commit sexual assault? At the end of this video, at the end of this video, at the end of this episode, I bet you think a little differently. But enough about that. Let's get to John Ziegler. Let's get to the show. I'm excited to welcome on Menace to Sports, um, someone that, that I consider somewhat of a friend, even though we've never met, um, uh, uh, John Ziegler, who's a senior columnist at Mediate. And really, uh, if you follow him on Twitter, if you don't, you need to, uh, because he provides a lot of what I, what I would call truth. Like he, he's interestingly like refreshing because he provides actual facts that maybe sometimes go with a conservative narrative, but at the same time, we'll talk about how Str Trump is an idiot. I feel like he's aligns with me on so many things. Like I'm, I'm not a Trump fan and, and we're not going to talk politics. So don't worry about that. But, but just so much that he puts out is just factual based and it's truth. And it kind of bucks the system, the narrative driving that goes on in the media. Um, and if you haven't heard today, Thursday, April 15th, he's dropping, I mean, a bombshell about Jerry Sandusky. So we're going to talk to him about it. Um, the, the, with the benefit of hindsight is the name of the podcast. And, and how many episodes are there, John? Like 19, 18, something like that? Well, we released the first episode as well as over 17 hours of raw interviews that are almost all exclusive. Uh, and eventually, yes, there are 19 different episodes, all of which, by the way, are very extensive episodes. These aren't 20 minute, 45 minute episodes. Most of these are two, three, sometimes four hour episodes. We, myself and Liz Habib, who's a television uh, sports anchor for the Fox affiliate here in Los Angeles, spent about a hundred hours in an LA uh, radio studio over the last year, putting this documentary podcast together. It's an extraordinary endeavor. And I think I'm pretty confident that people who give this a chance 
are going to find it to be mind blowing. Oh, well, I'll tell you this. Uh, so, so John sent me a, a, a media dump basically uh, on he, the, the website is framing And I, I spent, I don't know, probably five, six hours just this week prepping for the interview. And I didn't get through, I feel like I didn't even get through 10% of it, but it is stuff that makes you go, wait a minute. And it, you know, you head scratch. So, so to start off, this is the narrative that I knew, right? The narrative that the media fed me, which I am a, an expert on media narratives at this point in my life, is that that Mike McQuarrie walked in, saw Jerry Sandusky uh, sexually abusing a kid a shower, told Joe Paterno, it all got covered up, and years later it came out. Paterno got fired, Sandusky got thrown in prison, Mike McQuarrie disappeared off the face of the earth, and that was the end of it, right? This serial child predator went to prison and he was covered up by one of the greatest coaches of all time. You are now in this project kind of exposing the truth, right? And the, the truth is what? That it was all a perfect storm uh, of circumstances that not a, not a conspiracy. Let's be clear about this. I'm an anti-conspiracy person. Right. That it was a perfect storm of circumstances that created a tsunami of massive injustice, which included not just Paterno and Jerry Sandusky, but let's not forget three Penn State administrators, including the former president of Penn State, Graham Spaniel, the former athletic director, Tim Curley, the former vice president, Gary Schultz, all of whom had sterling reputations up until this. Their lives were destroyed. They've all been convicted of misdemeanors. Uh, two of them have spent extensive time in prison. Graham Spanier, as we speak, is probably going to be going to prison soon. Uh, th this thing uh, was huge. And if people who don't remember, it's hard to forget it. But 10 years ago, 2011, when the story started to break, like almost exactly 10 years ago, it was the biggest sports scandal in modern American history. And like most people at the beginning of this, Zach, I presumed, OK, at least most of this has to be true. Right. It didn't feel right. Some of it didn't feel right. Uh, you know, I don't have the same kind of football background you do, but I have coached high school football in a couple of different states. I've covered college and pro football for television and radio. I know the culture. I know the environment. And the, the story that you reference, which most people still remember to this day, which is that Mike McQuarrie, a, a now former assistant coach, at this time, a graduate assistant coach at Penn State walks into a shower and sees Jerry Sandusky sexually abusing a young boy said to be 10 years old or thereabouts, and that Joe Paterno basically did nothing and that Penn State covered it up for a former assistant. Jerry Sandusky wasn't even a current assistant coach at the time. Right. That, that didn't make sense. And now a lot of it doesn't make sense to me it just with the original story that's before kind of all all the information that you brought to the table that I'm not even close to through and so so let's let's start with that event right that was the event that really everyone hangs hangs on to right that Mike McQuarrie walks in experiences this and I have two questions about that just after what a decade long uh, investigation basically is what you did into this this whole situation is one there's a lot now that you're bringing out that, that confuses the facts of that and the likelihood that it happened, right? That it, not only that it happened or, and when Mike McQuarrie said it happened. And the second question I have for you is why would, a? I mean, I met Mark, Mike McQuarrie. It's, it's not a small guy. Um, he, why didn't he intervene? Why didn't he do anything? Like, how do you let that happen? Well, the second part of your uh, question, I think, is one that a lot of people have had, even even some members of the news media who have completely embraced this crazy narrative from the beginning have, have often thought, well, isn't it odd that Mike McQuarrie did nothing at the right. time uh, at all? And in fact, I believe, Zach, that the evidence indicates that not only did he do nothing, not only did he not beat Jerry Sandusky up or right. save the boy from imminent peril, I don't even believe he made eye contact with Jerry Sandusky and the boy. And, and for most people, they go, well, that doesn't seem to make sense. But of course, everyone wants to make excuses for McQueer because we need to accept that that happened because that's the central part of this entire, what I now believe to be a fairy tale. And without it, everything else collapses. So the media has made up all these excuses and the prosecution did that McQueary panicked that he was shocked. And I'm like, okay, I get that it would be shocking to see a local legend sexually abusing a boy in a shower. 
But this is, as you've already mentioned, a guy who is in his uh, late 20s. He's uh, six foot three, six foot four, 230, 240. He's been a quarterback for a Division I football team that plays on national television and in front of 100,000 people. This is not a guy prone to panic, right? right. And so, so from that standpoint, that doesn't make a lot of sense. But I'm willing to put that aside because I now believe 10 years later and after this extraordinary investigation that we've done that you don't even need to go there because there is nothing about this story that doesn't, first of all, that makes any sense, but even holds up under the slightest bit of scrutiny. And the first thing about this, and this is the subject of the first episode of our podcast with the benefit of hindsight, is when did it happen. See, I, I know a lot of people are very hesitant, understandably so, of delving into this case because they think it deals with very icky, horrible uh, allegations of child sex abuse. And then eventually we get into the weeds on all of that. But the first episode is about when did this happen? And I believe that simply by looking at when this happened, when it's alleged to have happened, and when it actually really did happen, the whole story obviously falls apart completely on its face. And that's before you even find out who the boy in the shower was, who we now know. I was the person who discovered who the boy in the shower was. And once you hear that whole story, you're going to go, this is the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. All this right. So, so, so tell me, happen. tell me this, why does it matter? Why does it matter what day it was, what month okay. it was? Why is that relevant? Well, let's go back to the timeline here. It's always about the timelines. Right? right. So, so when we hear about this story in 2011, we're told that this happened about 10 years earlier. Now that was the first thing that made my alarm bell start to go off. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. We didn't know about this for 10 years. Right. How was that even possible? I, that, that, that makes no sense whatsoever. But OK, I'm listening. I'm listening. So when about 10 years ago, back in 2011, when the story breaks, did this happen? When the grand jury presentment comes out and the media explosion happens, we're told this happened on the evening of March first 2002 which was a friday night mm -hmm. eventually uh, in a in a hearing the prosecution will try to use that date as proof that sandusky knew he would be able to pull this off because that happened to be the first day of spring break march wow. 1st 2002 and that somehow his grand plan was to bring this boy into a semi-public shower which hundreds of people have access to 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 rape him uh, in the penn state football uh, lo locker area uh, right. that that was the plan and that he could get away with this because this was the first day of spring break first night of spring break right it'd be a ghost town right right it's a ghost town there's no one around so he's, right. he's got full full freedom to do whatever he wants he doesn't bring him to his house for some reason but he brings him to the penn state locker rooms and um and so that is the story. In fact, Zach, if you look carefully, even to this day, there are some media reports that will still claim that March 1st, 2002 was the date. And that's important because supposedly the next morning, the first thing McQuarrie does after calling his dad and then meeting with, supposedly with his dad's friend, Dr. Dranoff, is he goes to see Joe Paterno the next morning on a Saturday mm -hmm. morning. That would have been March 2nd of 2002. That urgency is everything, right? because they have no contemporaneous report. There needs to be urgency on Mike McQuarrie's part. He needs to go to see Joe Paterno, even though it's weird he's not going to the police. He's going to see Joe Paterno, okay, right. fine. So, but there needs to be extreme urgency because if there's not extreme urgency, then clearly he didn't see a rape, right? Yeah, right. So, so you need there to be an immediacy of McQuarrie's reaction. Well, something happened that was, to me, the most dramatic moment of my early investigation. So the, the whole media firestorm happens. Paterno gets fired. Paterno dies. And we're preparing, you know, for Jerry Sandusky's trial, which is a fait accompli. Even in my mind, I'm not even that concerned about Jerry Sandusky's trial, although I'm thinking that the cover-up allegation against Joe Paterno makes no sense. By the way, 
I grew up in Pennsylvania, but I went to Georgetown University. I have no connection to Penn State, no dog in that hunt. I wasn't even a huge Paterno fan, although I certainly respected uh, what he had done at Penn State uh, and, and thought, frankly, that he should have retired earlier. And if he had, none of this would have yeah, happened, right. in my opinion. But so it's not as if I'm a Joe Paterno uh, sycophant, but I was concerned about the allegation against Paterno not making any sense. So suddenly, in early 2012, the prosecution very quietly says, um, oops, remember when we told you this happened on March 1st, 2002? Yeah, um, that didn't happen. Um, Mike, um, you got the date wrong. You got the month wrong. You got the year wrong. It was actually February 9th of 2001. And the reason why they had to change the date, and they've done a lot of deceit about this, and when Louis Free had his free report paid for by the Penn State Board of Trustees to give them the exact result they wanted, contrary to, you know, very counterintuitively, but very easily proven, uh, there, there was a lot of deceit about how that date got changed. That date got changed because Penn State Administrator Gary Schultz who I've interviewed for four hours, and you've heard most of that, and that we've released the, those interviews uh, with the with the podcast uh, uh, debut, uh, because he provided his emails to the prosecution, and those emails proved that the date of the Paterno meeting was not in 2002; it was in 2001. It was on February 10th. February 10th of 2001, which is a Saturday. So the prosecution decides, oh, well, okay, that's embarrassing. Thankfully, the news media is going to cover for us on this and not make this too much of a big deal since the <laughs> only witness just got exposed as not knowing the date, the month, and the year of this cataclysmic, catastrophic event, <laughs> uh, which, which ought to, right, well, let's be clear, right off the bat, his credibility is cracked. I mean, you, you, you can't miss the date, the month, and the year of an event this big and, and have your word be at what we're going we're gonna to put everything on this. But so the prosecution decides, all right, so uh, we now know the, the paternal meeting was February 10, 2001. That means that this assault must have happened. It has to. Has right. to have happened February 9th, right? Because we need urgency. It has to have been the night before because any more than that, You'll, you'll give McQueary, you know, some some slack that he didn't go see Joe Paterno that night. It's a Friday night. Joe's old. He's a legend. You wait till Saturday morning to call him and and you go see him again. Not sure why he's not going to the police if he saw a sexual assault. Not sure why he didn't beat the crap out of Sandusky. Not sure why he didn't go save the boy. But fine. OK, whatever. Weird things happen. Weird things happen in stressful situations. So that is how the prosecution comes to the date of February 9th, 2001. And Zach, my biggest mistake, and I have made hundreds in this nearly decade long investigation to find the truth of what really happened here. My biggest mistake was accepting the idea that the prosecution could not have gotten the date wrong twice. That was my biggest mistake. I naively and stupidly thought, okay, there's no way. It's weird that they got it wrong once. There's the second date has got to be right. And when I interviewed Jerry Sandusky in prison for uh, over three hours and then interviewed him again on the phone twice from prison, and again, presuming Jerry Sandusky was guilty, but finding his answers to be very weird and him being nothing like what I was perceiving him to be. And my, uh, you know, alarm bells are going off in my brain. What the hell is going on here? None of this makes any sense. There was one thing I knew for sure after all those hours of interviews with Jerry Sandusky. And that was he knew in his bones that February 9, 2001 was still not the right date. Why? I thought, I, I thought, okay, that is that is weird. That is really weird. And he knew it because he knew that the the event that he was called in to talk to Penn State about, and he knew the boy involved, a, a, a boy he was very very close to by the name of Alan Myers, who's as I've already referenced is a whole other story of this incredible tale. Uh, but he knew that that event was connected to two things happening. The debut of his book, which 
somehow became evidence in this case because it was bizarrely titled Touched, which got mm-hmm. used as, oh, my God, a pedophile has titled his book Touched. Right. And him losing out on the Virginia football head coaching job that he that in his mind, those two things, those three things were connected. The book, the Virginia job and this event that he would eventually get asked about by Penn State and offer for them to talk to Alan Myers because he's like, I don't know what you're worried about. Alan was there with me. He'll be if I, happy to talk to you about what didn't did not happen. And so I did a cursory investigation because remember, I do the Sandusky interview and immediately the Today Show uh, and then hosted by Matt Lauer was going to have me on, was had agreed to have me on to talk about my Sandusky interview and to play clips. And I didn't have much time, I, although I didn't use the time as, as I should have. But I had a lot of things going on and I I. I went and did a cursory investigation of that date, February 9th. And one of the things that Sandusky was positive about was that he would never have taken Alan Myers out of school uh, to, to, um, to be, to spend the day with him. And he knew that the day of the so-called McQuarrie event, he had spent the day with Alan Myers. Mm -hmm. And so I checked with Alan Myers school and sure enough, February 9th, they had school that day. And I'm like, okay, that's weird. But I'm still presuming Jerry is guilty. So I'm thinking, is he, has he come up with some s- crazy, you know, uh, way of confusing me or to get me to buy into a, a, the wrong narrative or the, the wrong uh, victim here? And so I, I tabled it. In my gut, I knew that there was a problem with the February 9th date but I stupidly tabled it because I had too much else going on. And again, I'm presuming Jerry Zanesky is guilty. So what difference does it really make? Right. Right. So, so what, what, it doesn't really make that much difference. So we fast forward several years and this is always in the back of my mind going that February, there's something wrong with February 9th. There's something wrong with February 9th. Well, then several things uh, come to be clear, by the way, uh, you know, thankfully, it's because other people who have been following this case and know my concerns about February 9th did their own investigation and found other things. And so now we have been able to create a completely new narrative about why February 9th is impossible to have been the actual date. Now, February 10th was the date he went to go see Joe Paterno, but February 9th was not the day Mike McCurry saw Jerry Sandusky with, in a shower with a boy. I now believe with great certitude, as does Gary Schultz, who is key to this whole date issue, that it was December 29, 2000, that the McQuarrie episode occurs. And let's be clear. Remember, Mike McQuarry says it was a very quiet night on campus. There was no one around. That was why the whole first night of spring break narrative was important to the prosecution. Well, what's December 29th? Right. December 29th is the quietest day you can possibly have on a campus. By the way, Penn State did not go to a bowl game that year. This is 2000. Penn State's season ended in late November that year. The right. Mike Curry had nothing going on on December 29th, 2000. Absolutely nothing. In fact, uh, you know, I, I believe that what happened was he was watching the Peach Bowl uh, between uh, LSU and Georgia Tech. I think the, uh, it was between. And um and I think he then went over to the to the last locker room because he was bored out of his mind. Uh, and I can get to what I think he actually saw in a, in a bit. But here's why we now know that this is the date. And it's not just Jerry Sandusky. And it's not just Gary Schultz, who we've interviewed. It's actual prosecution witnesses. Prosecution witnesses inadvertently tell us, if we put this, this puzzle together, that there's no way. There's no way that February 9th works and it gets a little complicated and you have to listen to the Gary Schultz interview to understand. But the two people that Mike McQuarrie saw the night of this alleged event, his dad, John McQuarrie, and his Dr. Dranoff, who I've already referred to, they testify that they meet with Schultz up to three months after Mike tells them about this event. Three months after Mike tells them about this event. Well, when did that meeting occur? We now know that that meeting occurs in 
uh, uh, late February between, say, the 22nd and the 24th. That's not three months from February 9th. That's 10 days or maybe two weeks. <laughs> That's a There's big difference. That's a, a huge difference. And so if you backtrack all this, and, and we have an article from the newspaper where on December 30th of 2000, Jerry Sandusky is doing a book signing for that book in State College. He had done a book signing on the other side of Pennsylvania on the, on the midday of December 29th. What really happened that day was that he had Alan Myers with him in the book signing in, in Western Pennsylvania. He drives to State College because he has the book signing in State College the next morning. He actually calls a friend of his, or actually his, I think his friend called him because his friend was very interested in what was going on with the Virginia head coaching job situation because Jerry had, had, had uh, interviewed four times for the Virginia head football coaching job. Now, you know how big of a deal that is. That's oh, yeah. not you know, something that's not going to get vetted, right? This has been public knowledge. It's in the newspapers. Jerry Sandusky might come out of retirement to be the head football coach in Virginia. Well, his, his friend, who was his college roommate, has a son who's at Virginia. He's understandably very interested in, is Jerry going to get the job? Uh, he, he remembers explicitly talking to Jerry on his way back from that first book signing and mocking Jerry because Jerry couldn't figure out how to pump the gas. And here Virginia was about to make him their head football coach. So this, and this guy is as straight as an arrow. I've interviewed him. He remembers the whole thing. So now we have a perfect convergence of events. December 29, 2000 is a very quiet day on campus. It is con connected to both the debut of his book where he's doing book signings on the 29th and the 30th. We have a newspaper article to prove that. And the Virginia head coaching job gets filled by Al Groh at the last minute on December 30th of 2000. All these things come together, making Jerry Sandusky's version of events 100% uh, compatible with everything else, including those prosecution witnesses I told you. So this, I realize this gets confusing, but if you accept, and I think after you listen to the Gary Schultz interview, you will, that December 29th is in fact the, the real uh, date, McQuarrie's story completely collapses. And here's why, because now we've got a six week gap from the time he sees whatever he saw in the shower and when he goes to report it to Joe Paterno. And that's not urgency. That's not even close to urgency. That's calculation. And then, Zach, we have what I believe to be, and I think as a, as a former football coach, you'll appreciate this, the, the coup de grace to why this blows apart McQuarrie's story. Because you might ask, all right, well, John, why did he go? after six weeks to go see Joe Paterno, right? That's a good question. Absolutely. What finally what finally provokes Mike McQuarrie? Because we do know that it was February 10th of 2001 that he goes to see Joe Paterno. Well, a remarkable coincidence. There's a remarkable coincidence that happens on February 9th of 2001. It's not that Mike McQuarrie sees Jerry Sandusky in a shower with a boy. It's that Mike McQuarrie finds out that Kenny Jackson, who had been the wide receivers coach at Penn State, had just left to go to the Pittsburgh Steelers. So and he wanted the, a job. Right, and the, exactly. So the wide receivers coaching job has just opened up. And Mike McQuarrie realizes, this is my chance. I'm a lowly graduate assistant. And you know how lowly graduate assistants are. You're, you're, you're basically a nobody. And the wide receiving coaching job is the job he wanted. And most astonishingly, Zach, for the cover-up theory, Mike McQuarrie doesn't get the wide receivers coaching job, which is the first thing that would happen if there had been a cover-up here. The first mm. thing that would have happened. Let's, let's, let's put out the cover-up theory, okay? So Mike McQuarrie sees this horrible thing. He goes to Joe Paterno. Just happens, just happens to happen on the night that the Kenny Jackson job opens up. Just a <laughs> remarkable coincidence. And, and he goes to see Joe Paterno. And Joe Paterno, for some bizarre reason, wants to cover this up for his former assistant coach he doesn't even like. 
Jerry Sinatsky. And you know he didn't like them because there's only one picture of Joe Paterno and Jerry Sinatsky they ever use. It's like 100 years old. And the, the media that uses it constantly. They, it's infamous in State College. that They didn't really like each other. They didn't jive. There, there was a religious uh, problem between the two of them, Protestant versus Catholic. Goody, you know, they were both fighting for credit over the national championships. There was animosity there. So, so let's pretend that for some reason Joe Paterno, after this incredibly storied career of following the rules at all times, decides suddenly on an instant that he's going to cover up for a child sex abuse that doesn't even work for him anymore, as crackpot as that is, right? Well, let's pretend that happens. The first thing Joe Paterno, being a good Italian, would have done running a cover up is said, um, OK, Mike, uh, thanks for coming to us. This is good information. By the way, congratulations. Uh, Kenny Jackson just left to go to the Pittsburgh Steelers. You're our new wide receivers coach. Uh, and by the way, just keep this quiet. Just keep this quiet. Right. That's what would have percent. 100 percent. Right. That's what you do. Right. You, I mean, if you want to cover it up, let's play. Let, let's play cover up mode. You got to keep the informant happy. Right. You got to keep him close and keep him happy. You certainly don't right. not give him the job that just conveniently came open and is at your disposal in your arsenal to cover up. Right. Right. And so uh, exactly. But here's what happens. Mike doesn't get the job. And you and this, if you really want to get deep into the, the psychology of this case is so fascinating, Zach, because McQuery, some people who follow this case might remember that McQuery claims that when he calls Joe Paterno that Saturday morning, that Joe Paterno says to him, Mike, if this is about a job, don't bother coming over. I don't have one for you. And in retrospect, I believe that is Mike McQuarrie's subconscious covering for his lie. Right. I don't believe that that conversation happened. And the reason why I don't believe that conversation happened is that in a bizarre <laughs> coincidence that at the time I thought was totally irrelevant, I happened to be sitting at the very table where McQuarrie and Paterno allegedly had their infamous conversation in the Paterno home in front of numerous other people, including members of the paternal family. And I referenced that testimony by McQuarrie. I don't even know why I did it because I never thought it was that important. Sue Paterno, Joe Paterno's your longtime uh, wife and with a, a, a legendary memory. She's over, I think, getting peachy paternal ice cream in the kitchen. And she hears me say that Joe told Mike, if this is about a job, don't bother coming over. I don't have one for you. And she turns around and snaps at me. And this is a woman I've never met before. And I don't think I've ever met her since. And she says, that didn't happen. And I'm like, whoa. whoa. <laughs> Remember, she, she was there that day, Zach. Now, right. I, I've been around a, a, a lot of uh, couples that have been together a long time. And when the wife <laughs> says that the husband didn't say something and she was there, uh, I'm very open to believing that. Oh, uh, and especially with that kind of uh, fierceness in, in her recollection and her certitude. Now, why is this important? I believe that to you, as you've already acknowledged, I believe that, uh, that Mike goes over because he wants the job right. and that, and and he knows that eventually this is going to be about uh, the job. So he needs to cover for this. So he's worried that people might figure out that this is about the job. So he concocts a story involving a dead man. Remember, Paterno is dead. So he concocts the story that Joe Paterno had told him that, uh, you know, that this is about a job. Now, let's be clear. This is not about a job. Well, he said that because it was about a job and he doesn't get the job, which blows up the cover-up story. But just to be clear, and this is important. Guess who gets the job three years later when it opens up a second time? Mike McQuarrie. Yep. That, that, so, those, so we now know that's the job Mike McQuarrie wanted. That's mm -hmm. the job that Mike McQuarrie would eventually get three years later when Paterno finally decided, okay, Mike, you've proven yourself. Uh, you know, you can be our wide receivers coach. And there's other elements of the coaching part of this uh, scenario that I think you'll particularly appreciate that make Mike McQuarrie's official story completely absurd. You know, he, he claims that, well, the reason why he got the date wrong at the beginning was he just, he just couldn't remember 
you know, the date, the month and the year. Now, I would submit that, you know, this is a big event. You should probably remember at least the year in which it happened, especially as a college football coach. Remember, college football coaches, college football coaches are all about the year in which something happened, right? Because it's one of the few sports that happens within a calendar year. Right. So you, your whole life is about what happens in that calendar year. So to me, a football coach is more unlikely to forget the year in which something happens than a normal person. But OK, maybe he's got a really bad memory, even for super huge events that occur. But here's the part that really, uh, from a football coaching standpoint, doesn't make any sense. If this had really happened on February 9th of 2001, there's an event two days earlier that would have stuck in his mind that would have been his peg for when this occurred. And that is that on February 7th of 2001, it's National College Signing Day for football players. And you know, that's effectively Christmas Day. Oh, huge day. And I think people, when they listen to this, both both this interview and your entire podcast series, go to your website, what they'll lose sight of is, is it's changed a lot with the advent of the, the early signing day with, oh, you know, now, now it's like kids sign randomly. It's not like it was five years ago, certainly not like it was back then when all of your hard work, everything you did for two years came to fruition on one day. And it was the first Wednesday in February every year. And it was, I mean, it was like you said, you, Christmas, it was like your bowl game signing day. Like those are just monumental days in your, you know, your year, like you said, you, there's a calendar year that's, that's always similar, but never the same. And, and I think another thing that, that you, as you're talking, just makes me think that this doesn't add up is the other thing that would be monumental and impossible to forget here is at, at a place like Penn state is not going to a bowl game. I can't, I, I don't know the history, but I can't imagine that was a regular occurrence, right? How you could well, forget that this happened during a non-bowl year, right? During the time that you should be at a bowl game. That, I mean, that I think happened to me one time in my entire career and it was 2012 because of sanctions. And I vividly remember the entire year because I'd never experienced December. So the probably the one year in Mike McQuarrie's career that he experienced December, he witnessed this and he forgot. It just doesn't Zach, add up are, to me. Zach, those are two really great points. The first one is really outstanding because you're right. The context of that date might not have the same significance today as it would have in, in, this, uh, two, two, in 2001. But your second point is one I've thought a lot about. And yeah. it's not just that, boy, it would have been more memorable that Penn State didn't play in a bowl game. I actually, when I start all this, when I go into any analysis, I do not presume nefarious motives. I actually try to look at it from the standpoint of people trying to do the right thing and just being human beings and getting it wrong. And I have often thought, and I'd be, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this. I've often thought that the lack of the bowl game plays a trick on McQuery in a slightly different way because the season is over in late November. That's very unusual at Penn state. It's almost always early January when the season ends. So, so in a weird way, if it slides the, the memory of the calendar and December 29th of 2000 can slide in your memory to early February. See what I'm saying? That he yeah. might have even he might have even forgotten that it wasn't uh, in February because in his mind, Seems a familiar. lot of time had passed. Yeah. Uh, between the end of the season and when he saw this. Well, it's right. A lot of time had passed, about a month. In fact, a little bit more than a month. But the season was over a month early. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, so yeah. there's a lot of memory issues and psychology issues. By the way, one of the foremost memory experts in the world, Dr. Elizabeth Loftus, uh, has testified on Jerry Sandusky's behalf and has, and has said that there are lots of problems with Mike McQuarrie's uh, testimony, among others in this case. And so I, I think that the most important part about the, the date issue is that the, the, the scenario 
from if this happened on December 29, 2000, and I believe the evidence is overwhelming. Malcolm Gladwell wrote an entire chapter in his best selling book, uh, Talking to Strangers, using my work on this issue, where he concludes exactly the same thing. And to have Gary Schultz now publicly uh, state that he believes that the date was December 29th. Remember, Gary Schultz is the whole reason why the date got changed in the first place. So if it really is December 29th, everything about this case is different. You now have no urgency from, from Mike's standpoint, which means he didn't see a rape. You now have Mike's credibility shot. You now have a completely different context for why Mike goes to see Joe Paterno and not the police. And once you decide that Mike McQuarrie is not believable on the allegation of having seen a rape, Zach, if you understand the rest of this case, it all crumbles like a house of cards. And that might be uh, giving, giving the prosecution too much credit because all of this was built on Mike McQuarrie. The public narrative, the media narrative was 100% built on Mike McQuarrie. They never even bothered to look at the accusers of Jerry Sandusky because they were so sure, well, why would McQuarrie lie? McQuarrie has right. to be telling the truth. And if McQuarrie's telling the truth, we don't need to bother with the rest of these accusers. Well, guess what? The, the, the two pillars of this case, Mike McQuarrie and victim number one, a guy by the name of Aaron Fisher, who we were told in November of 2011 that these pillars were made of stone. After 10 years of investigation, I've learned that these pillars were at best made of sand. And all right, they, so, so talk, talk to me about that. That was my next question, right? So, all right, McQuarrie's, this is my, my reaction to you talking, right? McQuarrie's shot, his credibility shot. Uh, I don't know what to believe. I, I do believe it was a guy that wanted a job and somehow that matric matriculated into, he saw Jerry Sandusky doing these things can, six weeks earlier. Can I just address that real quick, Zach? Yeah, yeah. Let me just address, because I, I, I don't, I am not a conspiracy person, all right? I think Mike got manipulated by the prosecution. I think I've always used the Loch Ness Monster analogy, okay? Mike had no idea about a Loch Ness Monster myth back in 2000 when this, when this happened. So he sees, using the Loch Ness Monster analogy, he sees some ripples in the water. He sees Jerry in the shower with a boy, which is naked with a boy, which is obviously weird and disconcerting. I've got no problem with that. And, and so he sees the ripples in the water and maybe the, the head of something weird poking out of the, out of the lock. But he doesn't think much of it, so much so he doesn't even remember when it happens. Right. So then ten, 10 years later, investigators desperate, desperate, after two years of an investigation going nowhere, desperate for a witness, get a, 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 a lead, a leak under very weird circumstances that Mike might have seen Jerry in the shower with a boy. They go to him and they say, Mike, we believe Jerry Sandusky is a monster. We got a, a kid named Aaron Fisher that says he's been sexually abused by him. Using this, the Loch Ness Monster analogy, now Mike has suddenly been told there's a monster in the lock that right. he saw 10 years earlier. And Mike starts to perceive those ripples and that head that he saw poking out is, oh, my God, I saw the monster. Yeah. And the, pro the investigators are like, fantastic. Tell us about the monster. Did the monster look like this? Did the monster do this? And Mike starts to hesitantly give them some details. Let's be clear. They also have Mike by the balls. They got Mike by the balls on a couple of different levels. Number one, uh, he didn't report this to the police. So, uh, so in theory, if, if he saw a crime and didn't report it, he's vulnerable there. Number two, we now know, and there's an amazing video, amazing video from a Rutgers game where Mike McQuarrie was the quarterback. And this actually, I think Deadspin did a story on this at one point. It's pretty clear Mike McQuarrie was betting on football games and may have fixed the game while at Penn State. So that's got to be in the back of his mind. And, oh, my God, uh, you know, do they know about this? Uh, are they going to use that about, about me? And then there's another thing that's maybe the most dramatic piece of, and we know this, and ESPN knew this, and they covered it up. We also know that Mike McQuarrie's first reaction when getting contacted by investigators, you're, you're, this is going to blow your mind. His first reaction was not as he would later say, oh, thank God, someone's finally coming to talk to me about Jerry Sandusky. That's the public narrative. No, 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 no. We know he was freaked out because he had been sending pictures of his penis to a woman, not his wife, through a Penn State phone. By the way, I have those pictures. Uh -huh. And so, so he 
he clearly felt very vulnerable going into those meetings with investigators. And so when investigators want to talk about Jerry Sandusky and from something that he saw 10 years ago, he's like, sure, what do you need to hear? And right. so now you have these, these, the, these bizarre, perverse self-interests where McQuarrie is self-interested in giving them what they want. And these guys are desperate for a witness and they've just convinced him. He saw the Loch Ness monster when all he really saw were some ripples in the water. So right. that's, that is my view of what happened with Mike McQuarrie. So basically, I mean, I'm just trying to put myself in his shoes, right? He, a guy that, you know, allegedly or possibly he fixed games when he played. Right. So that's something that you get in big, deep shit for, right. He's sending, dick pics to a, 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 an affair, right? Having an affair, sending dick pics to a lady. Oh, he's doing all this stuff. And when they come say, hey, this is about Jerry Sandusky, he breathes a sigh of relief. And he's like, okay, whoo, what do you want me to say? <laughs> right. Ding, so, ding, ding. You I, got I was it. interested and I don't want to get into, uh, and we'll get into it in a minute, uh, Gary Schultz and his role in all this. But but in your interview with him, the one thing that was interesting to me was just the the aggressive nature that, that investigators were going about these interviews and how they almost, they really planted a narrative in his head, right? When, when he went to do his grand jury testimony. So I'm sure they did the same with McQuarrie, right? The aggressive kind of painting a picture. Did you see this? And then giving vivid details. And it's like, damn, I don't know. Did I see that? 